Okay, we're here out in a uh, couple days. It's a public uh, information session on the proposed uh, bio lab. So I guess uh, we'll hear from people. The, uh, the real poop. Let us start uh, momentarily. Uh, not a whole lot of people, and there's food here. <laughs> Just letting you know if you're in the neighborhood, come down. <laughs> I'm live streaming. Huh? You are everywhere. I am everywhere. <laughs> yes, yes. I see at the Makiki neighborhood board. That's right. That's right. 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 Oh, that's right. That's where right. I ever right. you're and and you're, Yeah. And your name again? I'm sorry. Doug Matsuoka. Oh, yeah. We did meet briefly. But yeah. Yeah. I usually hang out with the uh, Occupy Honolulu people. Right. And so I'm here covering because a lot of people from town can't come down here. So I'm live streaming it now. You know, I I don't know her, but I've had some really good conversations yeah, with her. We're the, talking Midori. to Pat Lee. Yeah, yeah. Midori, yeah. yeah. And, and I really enjoy her perspective and her uh, her yeah, definitely. And definitely. her views. I, I respect her very much, and I, I enjoy talking to her. You know, a bunch of them now are now uh, have a pop-up encampment in front of Kamehameha School on, on uh, King Street. In front of uh, Kauai Hau Plaza. Oh, these Kamehameha School Plaza. Yeah. They're helping uh, protest uh, landlord injustice, helping the uh, Vegas family, Hawaiian Hawaiian family who's uh, protesting. So they're having that right now. <laughs> what, why are you here? What, are you, what is your... Uh, I'll get you on camera while you're... Uh, <laughs> okay, I'll turn. I'll get you off camera. What? Why no, you're? I'm, I'm one of the. Uh, I'm you're going to present uh, some the information. The for the oh, I see. Okay. Because you you come to the board meetings, you're talking about the rail. And that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, for at that particular board. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. I'm going to take a look at the materials, and this is going to start. Is there going to be presentations and stuff? PowerPoint. And, and you oh, okay. Might, you might want to get up bit, there. Yeah, and, you know, Save a good seat where you can take okay. a take a look at the. Uh, and I'll take a walk around okay. so people Thank can you. see. Okay, I'll, I will uh, take a walk around here and see the uh, information material we have. This is all presentations of Pacific Health Research Labs. Uh, and we'll hear more about it. Okay. I'm going to probably be up here because there are PowerPoint uh, presentations, and I'd like to be at a place where where we can see it. I wonder if I can uh, get permission to stand this close. I'll get the names here so we'll know <coughs> who's presenting. And I'll go over from this end. The university has something to do with it, so presenting. Barry Ostrander, Union Development Association. Now, there was a uh, poll in this morning's uh, advertiser. Very uh, kind of even, very close. Some people really want it, some people really don't want it. So we'll get the information here. to uh, give testimony to? No, I'm actually here to um, well, live stream it for people that couldn't make it out here. I, I don't think there was that it's being live streamed. So you're here with the... With the KITV, yeah. KITV, okay. That's absurd. That's going to get fixed, though, right? I hope, we hope soon. Because you have a uh, mayoral... Uh, yeah, it's starting up in a few minutes. Wow. So... Yes. <laughs> Good luck. Yes. Thank you. <laughs>
a reporter from uh, KITV who got pulled. Are you helping to put on the uh, yeah, presentation? Yeah, I'm trying to You know, I'm, I'm live streaming it. I was wondering if I, if I could stand over here so when they present the... Um, I think PowerPoint. right here would be fine. Is that close enough see, for well, you? Well, here you can see what I'm live streaming. What's the best for you? Actually, right up here, if you can. I think you can. Would that be okay? If, I, if you're here, you're not blocking anyone. Yeah. That's the most. That be you okay? know, that's what I'm worried about. And I won't be disruptive. I'm not here to yeah. say anything. I'm here to actually. Speakers, 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 speakers. Well, I can. You know, I think what they're saying is going to be important. Right, right. You know, okay. that, that's a, actually a good. Uh, that might be clearer, right? That's a good. Uh, but I don't. Point. Don't worry about my view. I just don't want people to come here to feel like they didn't get to see. Them. Okay, if I'm if I'm here and like <coughs> this, this won't get me. Well. well yeah, but you know. The, the well, angle of the lens. Is I know what. I can get you a chair to sit right here because we won't have this till after the PowerPoint. Oh, I see. Okay, that yeah, actually would be good. So that would be right great. Here. How's that? That would really be good. Isn't that good? Because they're yeah. not blocking anybody because they're not going to be there. I think that would really be great. Okay, if you just joined us, we're out at uh, Kapolei um, waiting for the uh, presentation of the information but, but then when the power plates are done I'm going to have to steal the chair back okay and then I'll move over here yeah okay that work, huh? that'll work perfectly great I have a good spot I'll be able to uh, live stream the powerpoint presentations and then uh, this is where a panel will be sitting and then I'll move back at this point and we will uh, get some uh, footage of that. Footage is kind of an anachronistic term. <laughs> it comes from film and there were feet of film in a reel. I bet young people don't really remember that. We're at the, uh, I guess the cafeteria all the time, cafeteria of Kapolei High School. First time I've been out here. A new uh, high school, so there's the alma mater up on the wall. Kind of a standard uh, <laughs> mountains in the sea and pride. It's good, good high school. I guess you should be proud. I went to Kalani myself. This is a potentially very uh, divisive issue. Uh, some people want it, some people don't want Biolab in the uh, neighborhood there's a a big uh, banner in the back no bio lab in our backyard there's a biohazard sign on it danger biohazard so you know it looks like it may not start in a while. I want to go back there and get a <laughs> look at the biohazard sign. I'll be back in a sec. I'm just okay. going to take a walk. Thank you. KITV is here. Not a whole lot of people. There are some... Uh, informational stuff here, West Nile virus. Very uh, unambiguous uh, sign here. No bio lab in our backyard, biohazard sign. Oops. <laughs> uh, site and planning, good. Oh, this will give us a real idea of uh, what's going on. Trying to find, well, I guess, oh, here is where the laboratory is uh, 
Clan, Ford Island Ventures, I guess that's a subdivision. City Park. Lab Park, just pointing out. This uh, purple is Saratoga Ave. Um, Ford Island Ventures, Hawaii Army National Guard. Airport Parking, Department of, of uh, Hawaiian Homelands. I think in, a, in the presentation we'll get um, We'll get uh, a clearer idea of where things are going to be. And I'll back up here and get a full view of the auditorium or the cafeteria, I guess, is serving as the auditorium. People here. Now, some people want it. Here's the guy with the Just Do It sign, which means that he's for it. Probably, uh, well, we'll find out why people are for it and why people are against it. I'm waiting for it to start. He just joined us. We're at uh, the Kapole, uh High school where we are waiting for presentation of uh, information and looks like a panel discussion. Uh, proposed uh, bio lab that studies uh, viruses and infectious diseases. Kind of a naturally made uh, controversial situation. Not a whole lot of people here though. Uh, this cafeteria can probably hold uh, hundreds of people. Uh, we don't have that many people here. Earlier I was talking to a gentleman who I meet, who we meet at the uh, Makiki Neighborhood Board, and who gives a re kind of a the pro rail report. He's one of the contractors. I guess one of the contractors here too. So you know, it's good depending on who you are and what your interests are. I would expect um, some of the local politicians to show up. Uh, but so far, I, I don't recognize any. It is scheduled to start uh, very shortly, so. I have a special seat here. So that we can more easily see the uh, PowerPoint. In fact, I'll move a little bit more uh, in front of it uh, when that happens. Stay tuned. I'm expecting the actual presentation to begin momentarily. I, there were a few uh, familiar faces aside from the uh, contractor, um, political activists, and in fact, uh, KITV news crews here. Now they're having a mayoral debate right at the moment, or, or at around the same time. Uh, they're actually not on the they're on the air, but they're not on cable because of. Uh, um, contractual dispute with the uh, Time Warner, which shows you how powerful uh, 
that kind of arrangement is. Uh, I see uh, some um, activists. I see the uh, publisher of the Hawaii Independent. Kaika Hussey just walked in, so we'll get some coverage of that at the Hawaii Independent. This is interesting. I'm actually sitting behind the speakers now, and uh, I might... It might be a, a good place. I can move, but... You know, we see the speakers all the time. Maybe we should see who's asking the questions and how people are responding. You know what I'm going to do is I'm going to... I might cut away briefly. I want to forward my phone uh, to Google Voice. So hang on, I'll be right back if I get cut. I don't know if we cut away. My phone is now being forwarded, so we don't cut off during this. I noticed another TV news crew show up. Now here are the limitations on news media. You send a crew out, and the crew usually is, uh, is uh, two people. Usually one person, the reporter person, and uh, another person who's the guy carrying the um, video camera someone either the reporter or producer or writer at the news station has to figure out what to say there's a very limited amount of time has to read through press releases mostly and synthesize that um, the other way to get information is from self-documenters like me or live streamers and just have this kind of thing running, you know, uh, have the people that are at the venues, for instance, like I spend a lot of time at Occupy, there's another channel actually where Occupy that's really good run by Nova Smith who, who's a resident there, uh, ustream.tv slash channel slash the pineapple glitch uh, words separated by hyphens the pineapple glitch at Ustream that's Nova Smith's uh, live stream channel from Deoccupy Honolulu really good source I live stream there when I'm there and that's where you'll get uh, a clearer idea of uh, what's going on I don't know how clearly the issues can be presented by this style of journalism. I think that model may be obsolete or be becoming obsolete. I just saw um, Senator Mike Gabbard walk in. Senator Gabbard has been a very long time opponent of uh, GMO. I see now a Senator uh, Willis Sparrow uh, who was the first and only elected official to visit uh, the Deoccupy Honolulu public forum so this would be fun maybe I'll go up and say hello I just want to say hello. You're, I'm going to be live streaming this. So. <laughs> Should be interesting. Should be interesting, yeah. So, uh, it's with Senator Gabbard. So, this could heat up. 
some people really uh, are against this. Some people want to see it happen. So stick around and uh, we will see what happens. I don't want to get people talked out before uh, the proceedings start. Uh, but if they don't start it up, I might start walking around and asking people what they think. Uh, Expecting uh, things to begin momentarily. We'll go see what Ikai is up to. This is the uh, publisher. Hey, Kaiko, I'm, I'm streaming this You're live. Anything? Uh, what's the what, what's the deal here? You think? What are the you Why are you guys there? Actually, live out here. Um, it sounds like there hasn't been a lot of. There wasn't enough publicity about this meeting. No, but surprisingly, there's a lot of people. So yeah. it's really sparked a, a lot of interest. Maybe I will ask them. I, I might get a chance afterward, too. But. I think it's a good idea. We need a bio level 3. Eavesdropping. Yeah. Kumia. Where in Korea? The tunnels? The old uh, pineapple factory area by the mountain side. I don't think anything's up over there. I, I don't know. See, I don't know. Is there something there? Before the gully? Yeah, yeah, before that. Yeah. I don't think so. What, what's up over there? Because I, I don't know what's up over there. I thought it was all just old agriculture areas. No, no, we're not saying the building has been Right, right, right. You're saying the building has been built. Right, right, right. Or what's up? I, I don't know what's up over there. I'm sorry. Oh, I said. I wanted to ask you some questions. I'm live streaming uh, to the internet. Oh, yeah, sorry. I was just having a conversation. Okay, sorry. Um, no, I don't know what's up there. I'll talk to you. I can be pretty interested like that. Let me let me see what if I can get a comment from this guy. Hi, my name's Doug uh, Matsuk. I'm streaming live to the internet. I notice you have this sign that says "Just Do It." You want to uh, say a couple words to people? Or why, uh, For who? Where? Well, this is going out into the internet, so whoever wants to watch oh, it. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, it's it's going to bring us into the forefront of the medical profession throughout the world. Our location here is crossroads of the Pacific. I mean, there are just billions of people coming and going and diseases that are unique to Asia or Indonesia or anything else or America that we need to find cures for. Now, there's some controversy here because I some understand. people think, well, you're bringing dangerous things in. I so understand that. What, what would your... Uh, I understand that, but it is not a concern to me. I've never seen the Department of Health or the, the medical profession jeopardize people. Uh, I'm, I have the utmost So you're trusting that the, uh, the medical school and the scientists would be able to 
medical schools and research laboratories and okay. the hospitals. Sure. Right, right. So you're saying the benefits outweigh the risks. Oh, my own. Oh, um, my, there's no comparison. Are you a resident of the area? Oh, yes. or I, I live in Vakaha, which see. is further west. Right, right. Right out by the end of the road. Almost. Right, right. But, yeah, we've been there for years, and my whole family is here. And, uh, and we're, uh, I'm concerned about things in the world. Yeah. And the health of the world is, is something that is a concern. My wife is a registered nurse. I see. She was fully attuned to anything in the medical world. Now, I was never in that. I was in the building trades or mechanical trades, but through my wife, I knew a lot about it medical issues and, and her concerns, and they they always alerted me and made sense. What brought you out to this uh, particular hearing? Because I heard about the people being upset about the, the germs. Right, right, right. Well, i got to be perfectly frank with you, sir. I probably brought some germs in here <laughs> to this meeting. Today. Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't do it on purpose, but somewhere... There's probably some well, It's not like Nile. You didn't bring any well, Nile, I don't know. <laughs> Nile How do fever. I know? But <laughs> How do I know we're yeah. not going to get tuberculosis or the West Nile or dengue fever right. or anything else that may come along? These things, they land on you. And you're traveling in an airplane, which is the worst incubator in the world for right. germs. Well, thanks uh, for for talking to us. Uh, again, your name, if you B U D, but okay. Ebel, E B E L. Great, thank you. I'm just a citizen. Great, thanks. So, thank you. Taxpayer, voter. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. we have one uh, participant uh, opinion, and yeah, waiting for this thing to get off the ground. We can hear the official uh, presentation. I have a lot of people here with name tags. So, I can ask questions here live on the internet. Tell me who you guys are and what, uh, why you're here. Uh, all right, uh, I'm Kelsey, uh, and uh, I'm a graduate assistant. And I work in the level 3 lab at UH. I'm Beverly, and I'm a research support at the University of Hawaii, and I too work in the uh, BSL 3 lab. I see. And where is that lab? It's at the University of Hawaii School of Medicine right. um, in Kaka'ako. Okay, okay. That's fairly new. Now, what is your position? Uh, this, this, the, um, this lab that they're proposing is kind of controversial. What is your participation and opinion of it? Anything you want to say about it? Um, we work in the BSL-3 lab, yeah. which is what they're proposing. Um, right. And so we're here for um, anyone who has any questions about a BSL-3 lab, so how it works. I see. Or, so. so the one that's going to be built is similar to this one, or is this this one that you work at going to be moved here? No, or? it's not going to be moved. Okay, so this is an additional uh, one? Yeah, it's going to be similar to it, yeah. I see, okay. Um, Pacific uh, Health Research Laboratory, That's a. is that part of the university, or is that a... Uh, that I don't know. I, you have to ask somewhere else. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm waiting for the uh, presentation to start, right, which is pretty soon, right? Yeah, it's already... Okay, good. Now, if you just joined us, this auditorium is filling out. There are a lot of uh, people with ID tags who are presenters. This lab is being proposed at least in part by the University of Hawaii.
I have a, uh, I'm getting decent bandwidth, there's a cell antenna nearby. I have a power pack. As long as you want to watch, I will be streaming this. We're expecting the presentation to begin momentarily. Uh, another politician yes, council member, Tom Berg, just walked in. <laughs> Tom Berg is an, uh, an opponent of uh, GMOs, so it would be interesting to see what his opinion is. So by my count, we have uh, <laughs> Senator uh, Willis Farrell, Senator Mike Gabbard, uh, council member Tom Bird here. You know, I, I hate saying it, we can count on um, politicians for self-serving statements. So we'll, <laughs> we'll see if anybody makes some kind of statement. We'll catch it uh, as soon as it's spoken. It's a somewhat controversial project. Tom Berg always speaks his mind. Where did he go? When he goes say something. I don't know if the uh, Babes Against Biotech have taken an official position on this. <laughs> Getting some um, Twitter comments. Fran Swami. Um, I'm just reading your stuff now, so I, I she did, you did uh, submit some questions to ask uh, these women who work at the uh, UH Bio Lab. Ask if they are required. I'll go. I'll go ask. I got. I got a couple questions that people have, and one was uh, if you are required to report. Uh, an infection or some kind of accident, I guess, to the public, if that happens, is there a protocol to do that? Um, what we do as laboratory workers is if there's an incident, uh, any, something that goes on in the lab is unusual, we yeah. report it to our superiors. I see. And there's a protocol where you have, protocol you have to do have that, to absolutely, report. right? And they themselves, it goes up the chain, yeah. Okay, what if, what if you made a mistake and caused it and you, you don't no, want to <laughs> there, are, there are big, oops, okay, thank you. Oh, five, we have five minutes. So, I urge you, before we start, if you'd like some more food or you want to get another cookie, like I do, go over and help yourself and, and sit back down. We've got about uh, five minutes. Thanks. I'll leave my uh, social stream up uh, in case you want to make comments or get me to talk to somebody or ask questions or if you want me to ask questions you can pop it into the social stream. And I'll keep that uh, screen up so I can see what your comments are. We just announced that we have about five minutes uh, to the beginning of the presentation. So.
No problem. Okay, we will begin momentarily. A uh, nice uh, auditorium here. First time I've been to uh, Kapolei High School, one of our newer high schools. Kapolei is a new community. It's, it looks like, an, I guess, a cafeteria. It's a big room, uh, roundish, uh, with a stage. Yeah, it must be auditorium if there's a stage. Fans at the top. I think it probably gets hot here. Um, Okay, I've been streaming for about 40 minutes. Got here early. Scheduled to start at, uh, at I saw at 6.15, so I was here at 6.15. Um, giving people a chance, I guess they brought food and refreshment. Kapolei is one of the newer uh, planned communities. On Oahu, the uh, main island by population of Hawaii. I guess almost a million people on this island of the 1.3 million total. I hope that's correct. Probably be moving around to try and get the best position, and uh, in that way too, are is superior to uh, conventional news, which are on tripods and not live. So, so there. Here we go. Okay, everybody, welcome. Uh, we're going to start the program. We're close enough to 7 o'clock, I think, to start. Thank you for coming. This is an informational briefing about the new Pacific Health Research Laboratory at Kauai Loa. Um, that's INCD. Uh, my name is Wally Zimmerman, and I will be your sort of facilitator for uh, tonight's informational briefing. I'll introduce the speakers. Um, and I will also provide your questions to a panel of people that we have assembled from the University of Hawaii, a group of experts in health and in research and in biosafety. And they'll be providing the answers to those of you who write questions down. So let me uh, give you exactly how we want to work this tonight. Uh, most of us don't know a lot about infectious diseases. At least I know I have. And we don't know exactly how they live in nature or what health officials can do about them when they find them. And so part of what the PHRL lab will do 
is, uh, is help us in that effort. Um, it's also going to be my role to help us stick to a timeline. We want to finish tonight at 8.30. And so in order to do that, we want to try to answer as many questions as we can. And we also want to be fair to those people who do not feel comfortable um, standing up and asking a question in public. So that's why we're going to ask you to write down your questions on sheets that we are handing out uh, right now. And the sheets will be one question to a sheet. Our staff will come by and pick them up. We'll bring them up here to the uh, front table and organize them and then uh, by topics, so that we take as many um, questions as we can before 8.30. Okay. The, the next thing that, that uh, yes. I, I want to just remind you, let's just put one question to a sheet. You can have as many you know, question sheets as you want, but it's easier for us at this end to organize them that way. Let me just also introduce a couple of people who are we are happy to have with us some of our elected officials are, have shown some um, great interest in this. First of all, uh, back and over there, Senator Mike Gabbard is here. <clears throat> and Senator Will Sparrow over there. <clears throat> and Representative Ty Cullen. I don't know if there he is. And Councilman Tom Burton is here. So the agenda tonight is relatively straightforward and simple. Um, we're going to make some open, have some opening remarks by a couple of uh, people I think are important to this project. Then we're going to have uh, uh, two PowerPoint presentations that are relatively short, but really provide a nice background for your questions and your answers. And then we will take the rest of the time for reading out questions and having our panel answer the questions. So, let us start with a, a couple of opening remarks, and I think appropriately we want to introduce um, Jean Arakuni. Um, Mr. Arakuni is the chancellor here at West University of Hawaii's West Hawaii. Jean. Thank you, Wally. Appreciate it. Um, I thought it would be good for me to just provide a bit of introduction to uh, Dr. Hedges, who's the Dean of the School of Medicine at uh, UH Manoa. Uh, it might seem odd because we're not a research institution on the west side. Uh, by the way, we're going to open for business August 20th. And we are invited to the uh, grand public opening, which is August 18th. We'll have music and food and uh, a, lot of, a lot of other things going on in the classrooms. To give you an idea as to what you, you or your sons, daughters, or uh, family members may experience at the state of the art institution now on the west side. Uh, well, I want to just share a story with you about an experience I had prior to coming back to Hawaii. I, I was on the mainland for 25 years. And most recently, before I took the job at West Oahu, I was at the Stanford University as an administrator. And what occurred during the time that I was there was uh, SARS, the SARS care. And because of Stanford's uh, large population from China, uh, we were in the middle of a real crisis. And uh, we were essentially at the mercy of the CDC and the uh, Regional Department of Health, because we simply had no other means of getting information. Uh, it, it was a very difficult and anxious time for all of us, because we didn't know what was going on. We'd get uh, uh, you know, some bulletins and some other information that came to a third party, and we had to cobble together a strategy as to how we were going to deal with this. Uh, when I started talking with uh, uh, Dr. Gaines was our VP for research and Keith Matson who's working uh, with the research lab. Uh, you know, I realized how important this endeavor is to have an early warning uh, system or place where we could get information uh, without having to depend on who was coming to us from the CDC as far away as the East Coast. And, and you know, just 
like, I mean, I don't I mean to say that it's the same thing, but when we have the tsunami, uh, uh, you know, research center here in, in Hawaii, every time it's happen, something happening in the South Pacific, they come to us for that information. Uh, so, come to Hawaii for that information. So, that, that's one of my experiences where I believe that this center uh, and laboratory will help the state of Hawaii. Uh, most importantly for me as a university administrator, what uh, Jerry and I were just talking about and what I believe will be a real benefit to, to our students is the ability to someday have uh, top-notch, nationally, internationally known scientists teaching classes at the West Oahu campus. Teaching classes at the West Oahu campus. There's simply no way that we could afford to hire people of that caliber. But through partnerships and collaboration with the uh, School of Medicine, uh, we may be able to get these researchers and faculty members to come to our, our classes and to teach on an ongoing basis. I mean, that, that's, that's something that is going to be extraordinarily beneficial to all of the residents of the West Side. So I wanted to share that with you. Uh, I believe in what the uh, uh, the medical school is trying to do with this project. Uh, we simply can't not do it. We have to do this. So thank you. I'll, I'll finish with those remarks. Thank you again. Now we'd like to uh, hear a few remarks from Dean Jarris Hedges, who is the Dean of the University of Hawaii's School of Medicine. Thank you, Wally. Welcome. As Wally said, I'm Juris Hedges. I'm the Dean of the John A. Berg School of Medicine. The School of Medicine is one of several university partners uh, based out of UH Manoa that would like to partner with the University of Hawaii, West Oahu, and the community for developing a vital, nationally important research center that would provide laboratory facilities and top-notch scientists to help teach the students of this community very important combination that we'd like to bring here, and we can do through a partnership. So what is my role tonight? Uh, there's going to be experts who work day to day in uh, the, the area of infectious diseases, which is really the science of how viruses and bacteria that are in our environment, that we're exposed to on a regular basis, somehow create infection and disease and produce illness. It's important for people to understand how that happens, why people are susceptible, and how to recognize what's causing the problem when it takes place. And sometimes it takes a very sophisticated facility to really make those diagnoses. So you're going to hear a little bit about that. I'd also want to point out some of the people who, uh, as their supervisor says, are in the trenches every day. At the medical school in Kakaako, we have a similar lab facility where we look at these very same agents on a much smaller capacity than what's planned. But today, uh, with us, uh, we have Kelsey Rowe, who is a PhD graduate student. Kelsey, raise your hand there. All right? All right. And then we also have uh, Beverly Arillo, who is a laboratory technician. And they can explain uh, later, at some point, sort of their day-to-day -day experience. It's, it's something they work with. Them. I walk through the building every day on my way to and from work. We work at this facility because we believe in what it brings the community. It brings us knowledge, it brings us understanding and ability to respond when infectious diseases affect our community. And it also helps bring top-notch scientists here and allows us to train our students in not only the practices of dealing with infectious illness-causing diseases, but also helps them become top-notch scientists themselves. And what could be better for Hawaii than scientists who treat needs of people of Hawaii who come from Hawaii, who were born here, raised here, and trained here. That's what we're all about. And I hope you'll learn a lot tonight about what value is brought by a facility, such as this PHRL that we're going to be talking about. Thank you. Uh, a reminder again about the questions. If you have a question written down and you want someone to pick them up, 
just raise your hand or let one of our staff know and they'll come by and get it. Or if you need another question sheet, just raise your hand and we'll, we'll go through the audience and make sure we get them. Uh, and if you can, and if you would like us to follow up with you later, write down contact information on the sheet. It's purely optional. But if you put it down, we will respond to you later. This is just to be clear about expectations tonight. This is an information briefing, and it is, uh, not, does not address the environmental assessment that is also being prepared this summer separately. Uh, that environmental assessment will be available in draft form towards the end of the month, um, and we will give you information on the PHRL website, which is in the handout for you, the exact address, um, for when you can write written comments or ask questions about the environmental assessment. But that's a separate issue and not part of what we have planned for, for tonight. Um, I'd like to start now with uh, one of the two presentations. And first, I'd like to, in I'd like to introduce Dr. Rick uh, Yamagihara, who is at the University of Hawaii's Johnny Burns School of Medicine. And he is an, one of those infectious disease specialists that Dr. Edges spoke about. Um, and we, he's got the presentation up next, Dr. Uh, Dr. Yamagihara. Get up here so we can thank you that. and thank you all for attending this uh, informational briefing of the proposed Pacific Health Research Laboratory. As you've heard, my name is Rick Inayahara. I'm a local boy. I grew up in Kakako, and as a young boy, I used to play on Ilalo Street. And the medical school is on Ilalo Street, so it's a very strange feeling every day when I come to work. Um, we had, as you've heard, a very small biosafety level 3 laboratory in Kakako in the medical school. Much of my career has been spent working in such, a facility, such facilities, PSL3 laboratories. And I, of course, consider them to be among the safest environments you can work in. But I know that some of you here have concerns about how safe these laboratories are. You have concerns about what risks they might pose to you or your family or to the community. Uh, also, you might have questions about what sorts of research is going to be conducted in this proposed facility. So I'm, I'm hoping that in my short presentation, I'll address some of these concerns. Uh, and I'll be followed by Keith Madsen, who will give you even more information about this proposed facility. So I'm going to cover these uh, four areas. First, really uh, the mission of the Pacific Health Research Laboratory, namely to safeguard uh, Hawaii's public health. I will also talk a little bit about biosecurity and biosafety and the Biosafety 3, Level 3 design. Uh, and finally, about practices and uh, training. So the, the key word here is biosafety. Uh, th these, these things are fundamentally part of this lab. So there are engineering aspects that go on to achieve safety as well as training and actual practice. So um, why does Hawaii need such a facility? So as, as we know, although we are in a very remote part of the Pacific, uh, 2,500 miles from the West Coast, and over 3,000 miles to Asia, with now jet travel, it's pretty easy to get here. And every day, there are many people coming to Hawaii and some of these people are bringing pathogens that have never been seen in Hawaii. So in many ways, it's not a matter of if, but really when such an outbreak might occur here. And in point of fact, um, we have a very small uh, safety level three 
laboratory for medical school, but it, Hawaii doesn't have sufficient laboratory space uh, to conduct the kinds of testings that will be required in the case of a very large outbreak. So Hawaii is particularly vulnerable. Hawaii is the crossroads for travel, for travelers, both recreational uh, travelers as well as immigrants. Um, and Hawaii, as I indicated, is very far from these testing laboratories on the mainland and elsewhere. And also, and also there has in fact been a global resurgence of infectious diseases, and now infectious diseases account for more deaths than any other cause. Um, and in fact, a lot of this resurgence has been due to mosquito-borne diseases, um, such as dengue fever, West Nile, encephalitis, We've all heard about SARS, um, avian influenza, and tuberculosis. And so we all remember the outbreak in 2001-2002 of dengue fever. Hawaii had been free of dengue for almost 60 years. And all of a sudden, in 2001, in fact, the, the first case was found the day after 9-11 in 2001. But in fact, retrospectively, there were many other cases. And these cases were due to local transmission of dengue virus. The dengue virus was imported from Tahiti and Samoa, and then took hold here and propagated and was transmitted. So dengue is still a continuing threat. Uh, it hasn't gone away. We still have the mosquitoes here that can trans transmit the dengue virus. And in fact, even as recently as last year, there were two, three new cases of dengue fever on HANA. Um, and as you can see here, almost every year, there are in fact cases of dengue. The, the other important disease here is tuberculosis. And I think many of us feel that We've already conquered TB, but in fact, Hawaii ranks first in the nation for TB. And in fact, uh, a lot of it is drug-resistant TB, so it's very difficult to treat. As you can see on this graph, the orange line shows Hawaii, and Hawaii is twice the level of the rest of the U.S. So it's really a considerable problem here. You presumably read about um, many students and faculty having to be tested at KCC and HGU earlier this year because of the case of TB. So TB is highly transmissible, it's treatable, um, but again, there are drug resist resistant cases, and so it has to be taken very seriously. So the types of research that we intend to do in this proposed laboratory really will focus on detection, treatment, and prevention. <laughs> to be able to develop better diagnostics, more effective treatments, and affordable vaccines. Also, we are going to be researching the immune response of humans infected with these types of viruses that require ESL3 containment. And finally, to develop new technologies. So, in fact, the earlier we can detect uh, the agent, the faster we can respond and know what to do in terms of control. This gives you some idea of the power of rapid diagnosis. This is uh, a case that occurred last year. Uh, the laboratory got a call at 2 p.m. on a Friday uh, of a child with dengue-like symptoms. The blood was drawn and received at the medical school at 3 p.m. And by 6 p.m., there was a confirmation of dengue infection. This same sample, had it been sent to the mainland, would have required at least three days after the sample was received by the testing lab, or sometimes as long as three weeks. 
So by, again, by having such a facility, uh, we can, in fact, facilitate and pace them. Diagnosis. Now, I'm going to go very quickly through what kinds of safeguards we have in such a facility. They are, of course, security, very high security. So even before you can get into the building, uh, there are security measures. But even after getting into the building, there are several steps you need to go through in order to actually get into the laboratory. And then the other major point to remember about a BSL-3 facility is that there's this airflow from positive to negative. So in fact, in the working area, it's negative pressure. And in fact, all air in this working area is exited through the laboratory, both through the biosafety cabinet um, and the rest of the room through HEPA filters. And I think, um, so, so this gives you some idea of, again, the person before entering verifies that the balloon is negative pressure. Uh, the main bit of equipment in such a facility is the biosafety cabinet. And so the biosafety cabinet draws room air into the cabinet that passes through HEPA filters and the specimen that's being worked on is getting clean air. So this safety cabinet protects both the lab worker, the specimen, and the environment. And anything that exhausts also goes through HEPA filters. And I think you all have heard about HEPA filters because you can find them even in things like vacuum cleaners. Um, but a HEPA filter will remove more than 99.97% more than of particles that are either larger or smaller than 0.3 microns. And so to give you some idea of what a micron is, so 0.3 micron, a, a, a human hair, the diameter of a human hair is about 75 microns. So this is about 250 times smaller than the diameter of the human hair. And so these filters are very effective in clearing things from the air. So the air that exits the lab is far cleaner than the air that comes into the lab. And so apart from these um, engineering safeguards, there are um, practice. Uh, safeguards. And so there, there's what's called PPE, personal protective equipment. And so booties are gone and an eye, safe eye with glasses and, and glasses are gone. Also, there's a buddy system in, in which two people work together in case there is uh, an accident or spill. And then all wastes are autoclaved. Um, that is at high pressure and high temperature for about an hour, and then double bag before that, and then the sent for incineration. The, the final matter is transport of materials, both in and out of the lab. And most laboratories like this actually get very few things coming out or going out. But with whatever goes out or comes in is in very small volumes, and they are packed in a way that they're, they're packed in these crush-proof containers uh, that, that resist implosion even after being dropped from an airplane. Uh, and of course, this kind of transport is regulated by the U.S. Department of Transportation, but also the Department of Homeland Security. And also, that there's a continuous um, trail of custody in, in transport of these sorts of things, even if it's a local transportation from one local vendor to the laboratory like this. So I, I think I'll end there, um, and we'll hear more from Keith Madsen. Thank you.
Thank you, Rick, and uh, thank you for coming out uh, in the evening to hear about this very important project. Um, my name is Keith Knotts, and I'm the project manager, and I'm going to uh, pick up from where uh, Dr. Yanagahara left off and talk a little bit about the national program that created this opportunity for us and show you uh, some examples of some of the other labs around the country. I think you'll find that very interesting. Um, first of all, the genesis of this uh, happened roughly uh, 10 years ago. Um, and the National Institutes of Health did a comprehensive uh, study, and one of the things they determined was the nation does not have enough sophisticated large-scale laboratory capacity at the regional scale to be able to address emergencies. And so they, um, uh, Congress um, allowed them to uh, put a grant program together for the development of a 15 lab network across the country, but 13 of those are the regional biosafety level three laboratories. And they uh, awarded these on a competitive basis to universities, and we were fortunate enough to get one of those 13 grants. This is what that network looks like. Um, most of those uh, laboratories, as you can see, are in the east and the uh, middle parts of the country, especially where the large population centers are. Uh, we will be actually the only lab like this um, to the west of Colorado. Now, this is a map I know you can't see, um, but let me explain why, what it is and, and why it's in here. This is a map showing uh, infectious disease outbreaks that occur in nature over just a two-year period around the world. And you can see that there are a lot of lines emanating from Africa and uh, Southeast Asia and Asia. Um, and I'm sure you've heard um, of, of some of the stories of these types of, of diseases. But there are also a few in North America. The other important thing, though, is you can see this is a global situation, and we live in a global network. And as Rick had pointed out, we are a crossroads in that global network. This is really a case where you need to think globally about infectious diseases and act locally to prepare. What I'd like to do now is shift into, because I'm, this is a, uh, um, a community meeting that looks at you know, a new project in your neighborhood, I'd like to show you some examples of where some of these other laboratories have been built. And you'll see they're in very, very uh, different situations, but all of them basically in populated areas. This right here, where the red circle is, is where they built the lab that is in downtown Birmingham, Alabama. It's an area that has a lot of retail, um, a lot of health clinics, uh, offices, hotels, and that's what their lab looks like. It's not a huge lab, but it's right there on that street corner. This is in Newark, a very dense residential area. That's their lab right there. It's surrounded by quite a lot of housing, recreational uses, a high school, a large university campus over here. And that's what their lab looks like. This is in Pittsburgh. It's the University of Pittsburgh. It's one of the levels of this uh, eight-story biomedical uh, research tower. Again, a very dense neighborhood. This is the, uh, the Colorado State um, University in Fort Collins, Colorado. The lab itself is just a small portion here. They have a fairly large um, research effort and vaccine industry in that part of the country. So quite a lot of these are office spaces for companies that are uh, working with the university on vaccines. That over there is housing, roughly about a half mile away. The director of the lab lives in that housing. That's the front of the Colorado State. This is the uh, University of Louisville in Kentucky. This is a little bit more analogous, I think, to the situation in Kaloa where they've got and we have this open space here for Louisville. It's a satellite campus of theirs, um, surrounded by housing, recreation, and I believe it's a shopping mall over here. This is the uh, University of Texas at uh, Galveston. They have a medical school branch. 
Um, their lab is actually a level four lab. It's built right onto the campus quad. And 100 feet away, you probably can't see that, that's a children's hospital. Um, as uh, Rick and others have mentioned, we have small DSL-3 lab in Kakako, in uh, this building here. And if you've been to Kakako, you realize it's a very uh, mixed-use neighborhood, residential, recreational uh, retail. So why locate the PHRL in Kalailoa? Well, as uh, Chancellor Awakuni mentioned, there are some very promising research and educational opportunities with your new campus out here, which I hope you should all be very proud of. It's a, a tremendous effort. And new employment opportunities. Um, as I look around Kalailoa, I'm amazed at um, how rapidly it's developed and how many new exciting opportunities there seems to be uh, for residents. Um, it's very convenient for us and the mission of this lab to be close to the National Guard. They have a uh, civilian support team that uh, deals with emergencies, and we'd only be three feet away from them, uh, 30, 300 feet away from them, excuse me. This is a secure site, so it uh, gives us a, a much more comfortable footprint to build on. And the John Rogers Airport nearby um, is available in the event of an emergency that would be uh, needed for public health. This is the site itself, shaded in blue. It's right on the edge of the National Guard compound. It's across uh, Saratoga Street from the uh, Rainbow Hangar, if you're familiar with that, and next to the Seafarer Center. It's currently a parking lot. It's been a parking lot for the last 50 years. Um, in terms of employment, uh, we're looking at possibly 20 positions overall. They will be a range of scientific and technical, um, but also some very important build, building engineer uh, positions and uh, maintenance workers, security guards. Um, we think that it will probably generate roughly 250 uh, plus construction jobs. And then these are very preliminary steps. We are just actually in the earlier stages of redesigning the building. So um, I don't want to dwell too much on these, but you know, roughly 30,000 square feet, a little bit more than that. It's not a huge building. Um, the important thing I think is, you know, we're going to have 24/7 security and a very redundant um, mechanical and power system. Project timeline, we're actually pretty early in this uh, effort, um, but uh, we are looking to get our draft EAA out the door um, sometime within the next uh, 30 to 60 days, and uh, announcements will be made on the, um, the website about that. Uh, and then the final we're hoping would be just a few months afterward. Planning and design, we're just in the beginning stages of that as well, but that would be roughly a two year period. Um, and uh, construction and commissioning in another two years. Community outreach, we've done more than you know two dozen meetings, not necessarily of this large scale yet. Um, as I mentioned, we're early in the process, but uh, we have been getting out and about and meeting with uh, a number of people. A number of you I recognize from those meetings and more are planned. So with that, I think uh, I'd like to wrap up now and um, I believe we're ready for the next stage of the Excuse me. Uh, excuse me, sir. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Do we have a choice in this? Do we get to say what we want this in our community? I'm sorry. If you'd like, if you'd like to ask a question, please write it down, and we'll answer. I'm sorry, this is, uh, you can ask questions and you can write things in, in, um, in a question form and these gentlemen will be more than happy to answer, but it's sort of rude. So let us, let me introduce the people who are going to answer the questions that you've written out and you've written out a lot of them, so let's get, get to them as fast as we can. So if I can ask, um, gentlemen, Everyone can come up and sit at the table, and I'll, and I'll introduce each one of them quickly, and we'll start with the, with the question. I'm leaving.
This is this is a bunch of crap. This is fake. Can I, uh, I'm streaming uh, live to the internet. So I heard, you know, they're only taking written stuff. I thought there might be a way of controlling stuff. I heard about this yesterday on Facebook, of all places. I've lived here for how long before Safeway was here? And then now this comes about, and this is more of something that's just telling us. This is going to happen in a community. This isn't about whether we're interested or do we want this. This is basically telling us, this is going to be in your community, deal with it. This is no fake show where, oh, if we want it in the community. We have no choice if we want a level 3 lab in our community. There's already a level 3 lab in Kaka'afu. Why don't they continue to develop that one instead of coming and put it in our community? Simple as that. Don't think like as if you care about the Kapolei community. I'm done. Hello. Thank you. Tell us your name. George Maneros. Thank you, George. Thank you. So, what guarantee that no true Okay, that was George Madero. Up on uh, Facebook. This is under the uh, of this, but if you sound that and if you want to use that microphone, click that on first. Um, click on that, uh, that microphone, Keith, and you want to start with this, uh, the safety question. I, I think that's the first one that we want to deal with. Uh, how safe will this lab be? Sure. Vivek, here you are. Hi. Um, so, uh, we have been having such kind of a lab on the island for the past 13 years, and there has been no incident. There have been no incidents in the lab. We can just take a break from there and understand that uh, this lab that we are having will be safe. Now, why I say that it will be safe, Dr. Yanagi, I mentioned to you about this filtering system. So, there are different levels of filtering system one at the laboratory level, and one at the penthouse level. So, the, so these, all the microorganisms, if they are going to release anything, they will be getting trapped in these uh, so-called HEPA filters. So, uh, and, and, and that's, that's the engineering system uh, which will protect uh, any of the microorganisms from going from the, the laboratory out in the environment. The next question that uh, we had, six questions about this. Why are you building it at Palaiola? Um, why not at another site? What are, were the alternatives? Why not on Wake Island or Johnston Atoll? And why not on the mainland? Why not in Kaka'ako? Why here in Kalailoa? Uh Keith, you want to? Sure. Well, I mean, I'll take the uh, part of why not off island. Um, the reason you want a facility like this where you live is because this is where uh, a public health threat could occur, like SARS. Um, as Chancellor Amakuni uh, opened with, um, when SARS hit, you wanted something in your area that you could depend on. And it's very important in response. Uh, it's basically like you want a hospital where you live, not somewhere else. Um, why call I You know, we, we talk about that quite a lot. Um, I think it's got an excellent uh, location for this type of lab. And we know we can operate it safely. And um, I think this is just a, a good opportunity for West Oahu, but also for the partnership with uh, uh, UH Noah and University of Hawaii, West Oahu. Anybody else? 
anybody want to add anything to those answers? Uh, why? Uh, one of the questions was, you, you talked about Wake Island and Johnston Atoll. What, why not there? Um, I think it's basically the same as uh, the dilemma of if you have to fly samples off to the mainland, uh, you're, you're losing time. You're losing time to be able to adequately respond. Uh, you really need the public health asset, asset where the people live. Okay, Dr. Hitt. I'd just like to add, back to the team that really Gene and I opened with, uh, this is a, a resource not only for helping us do appropriate diagnostics of uh, potential illness producing viruses or bacteria, which occur in our population, not because of this facility, but this facility is there to help us diagnose it. But more importantly, this is a means for us to provide important laboratory resources and a basis for bringing in quality educators who will help us understand more about infectious disease and will help train our youth. Without a facility like this to recruit world-class talent, we're not going to be as successful in building such strong academic programs as we want to bring here to West Oahu. And it makes no sense to put such a facility in the middle of the Pacific where there is no people, but rather it should be at a population center where you can use it for the educational value and not just a diagnostic laboratory. It's really a much broader community-focused facility than what it may be projected as simply as a diagnostic center. So it's a training center? Um, can, can I call? No, I'm sorry, we're not taking... You're not going to let me... No, we're not. It's an information... It's an information... I, I, keep on, I keep on hearing community here, but our community had two days' notice on this, on this meeting. That's not true, sir. You know, that is true. The advertiser didn't put it in the paper until yesterday. About 700 of our people in our community don't know anything about what's going on. I think this is the first of, um, of more um, community outreach that we can do on this for people in West Oklahoma. Let me keep going with the questions because some people we have 30 or 40 questions here that we want to answer. I'm sorry, we, we, can you just write it down so I can, I can read it? We'll get it. You know, we're gonna, we're gonna, this is going to turn into a free-for-all if everybody keeps yelling out whenever they feel like it. And I think probably let us get through some of the questions and see if you might re get some of your answers to the questions. There's still plenty of time to answer questions here. So my question is relative to the theme of the question. We will, we'll get to it. Okay, I'm on question number three. And this is, a, we're grouping these together. Okay, I, I will I will get to your question. Okay? If it's written down, you will get to it. The next one is this. What's the need for the PHRL if existing labs can pinpoint dengue fever in hours? What can you do that a normal hospital lab can't do? And this is probably more for one for scientists and one for doctors to cut to take care of. Um, can did you, Okay, Dr. Yamagata, thank you. Right, so as, as was pointed out, um, we, we do have the capability uh, in the BSL-3 laboratory uh, at medical school in Chicago to do these as they uh, in, in point of fact, there, there are no laboratories on island that will do dengue testing, remarkably enough. Uh, so these will have to be sent off island, um, and there's that delay. Do you expect they can try to get in four hours? Is that what his point was? No, we, we, we can do the test in three to four hours, but on the mainland it takes three days to three weeks. 
after they get the sample. Question four. This is about cost. There are a number of questions that were asked about cost. What does this what does this laboratory cost? What is the annual operating budget? Are there state and federal funds involved? And who's paying for all of this? That's the that's the next question, the next group of questions about cost. So the first part was what does it cost? Okay. Um, the budget for the uh, project is forty-seven and a half million dollars. Of that, uh, uh, $32.5 million is a National Institutes of Health grant to the University of Hawaii. Much like they um, granted the other universities you saw on that map, uh, construction funds for their um, operation, for their, their labs. Uh, another $15 million has been um, offered by the state of Hawaii as a cost match, as is very common in these types of projects, so $47.5 million. Uh, the other part of that is um, we've, we've done state and federal funding and the annual operating budget was the part that wasn't asked. Um, annual operating budget, we are going to uh, redo our business plan for it um, based on the kinds of operations we're familiar with at the uh, University of Hawaii. So we're going to be um, looking at that over the next year and a half um, as we decide how we want to operate this particular facility. Um, it's uh, tough to put an exact figure on it right now because it's an, inter in it's an iterative process between the uh, scientific plan and the design plan. The, the next set of questions is about oversight. Who, pro who provides the oversight um, for the facility and who has the final approval to build and operate this lab. Um, do you wanna, anybody wanna entertain that one? Who has the final approval on this project? Well, the, the um, project uh, is being done on uh, the HCA um, uh, Kalailoa district, and so uh, we're working with uh, ACDA on all of the planning and uh, design aspects of it that are relevant to uh, their oversight of the, uh, the district. And then um, as we, uh, the environmental assessment is done, then we can move into uh, the design process. And uh, eventually we would be getting the permits for um, construction and uh, building, of course, from the city. ACEA. Hawaii Community Development Authority. HCDA. Who all the first part of the question? Who's doing the oversight on this facility? Who's who's inspecting these guys to make sure that there isn't an accident? All right, let's um, yes, there's some um, good question. We, we didn't answer that one completely. Right? Good question. So so all of these facilities which are there all over the country, they are under strict um, strictly being observed by uh, the federal government, or the, at the first level, the state government, and at the UH, there are, there are minimum seven levels of, of, of different investigations which go on before any approval is given for conducting any kind of experiment. For example, the experiment has to be start, started by a researcher. It has to be approved by the University of Hawaii Institutional Biosafety Committee. This, this committee consists of 16 individuals. They look at the application and they have to approve that. Once that is approved, depending upon what kind of a uh, work is going to be done, it has to get a permit. It's an open discussion permit from the Hawaii Department of Agriculture. You have to apply for the Hawaii Department of Agriculture board and get their permit. Once we go through that, we have to get a permit from the CDC, or the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta. Now, after all of this is done, all of these people come and physically inspect the laboratory, their protocols, their SOPs. Most of these inspections by CDC, which we had very recently, are unannounced. They just show up at the door. And then we just drop everything that's what we do, 
and we undergo with the investigation, it goes on for at least four to five hours or two days. So it's a heavily regulated laboratory which has been closely guarded by the state government as well as the federal government. If I could just add to that, it's, it's actually the most heavily regulated uh, state for this type of research in the country because of the state uh, rule. How did the, the question was about the public, and uh, I'd like you to write down the question in a question form so I can so I understand. We're 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 taking written questions. I'm trying to get through questions. Thank you. This is about the environmental uh, assessments. This is first of all. There's a this is a two part question. Why is there not an environmental impact statement, an EIS, being required of this project? And secondly, what is the timing again of the environmental assessment that was talked about before? Um, so, do we want to handle that? Tessie, do you want to take care of that? So, for the District of Kalilo, formerly known as Barbers Point, um, Barbers Point Naval Air Station, the Navy was responsible for doing the overall environmental impact statement. And what triggers is that every single project, a new project coming into the district, has to do an environmental assessment, which takes all of the documents that were done in the past and look at the specific parcel and look at the use that is. Uh, being proposed for that parcel, and then do a part of the EA cultural inventory survey and, and uh, environmental impacts to that particular area. It takes into consideration traffic study, um, surrounding landowners. All of those aspects are part of that EA. The other thing I would add to that is um, this is actually two pronged. Uh, we have a state environmental uh, uh, law, you know, that the environmental assessment is being done towards, it's called Chapter 343, if you're familiar with that. And then in addition, after that, it's a, uh, the, the National Institutes of Health will also do, uh, be doing the federal NEPA EA. And all of the other 12 uh, regional biosafety level three labs that you saw on the network map, they all had environmental assessments that uh, complied with the NEPA EA uh, requirements. And, and the, again, uh, Keith, quickly, just the timing of that EA and when people can comment about the EA. Um, the, uh, the process for um, the uh, distribution and the issuance of the EA is done by the state. We set, uh, like all any other environmental document, we submit it to the state. They have their um, website, their clearinghouse, and they have a, uh, uh, a newsletter, if you will, electronic newsletter. So it will be available via their website. We'll make an announcement on our website when it is available, but of course it will be, uh, you have to look on the state's website to actually uh, uh, download the document. The next question is, there was some, there's a number of questions about like natural disasters, about tsunami. Aren't we in a tsunami zone here, and isn't that a problem? We're also near an airport, and isn't this really a bad location, not a good location, because of the impact of a possible tsunami or hurricane? The site uh, is actually 1.2 miles in from the shore, and if you look at the uh, state's tsunami inundation zone um, in this area, it actually is pretty close to the shore, so it's not in a tsunami impact zone. Maybe Indonesia, right? Uh, then there's several times, actually. Did you see how far in that tsunami is? But we're here in Hawaii, and this is what the state's uh, tsunami zone is. Hawaii, okay. right. Now, mm -hmm. um, the second part of the question? Oh, the, it, we're also near an airport, and uh, is that a, is that a help or a hindrance? I, I think it's well, I, I think it's an asset from the standpoint of, you know, the laboratory uh, for uh, situations where you would want to have in your, in your board, uh, by your airport. Um, I looked at uh, the uh, um, 
safety record out here at this airport and it's incredibly um, great, you know, because then any major incidents at this airport, one of the things that's very important, I think, um, is that this, unlike some airports where you have um, foggy conditions or um, topographical constraints, um, this is a very uh, consistent weather pattern and um, doesn't have uh, steep mountains that you have to descend over in order to make the approaches or takeoffs. This is the question that came from Matt in the corner there about the public inspections. The, the question is, how does the public get copies of the inspection reports, the safety inspection? Am I, is, that, is that it? How, how is the public going to be able to get access to those safety inspection reports? Um, are they public documents or how? All the documents which we have, they are public documents. Okay. So all the permits which we apply for, all the permits which we get, they are part of the Hawaii Department of Agriculture open document system. So if you need any of those information, you can always request from the Department of Agriculture and the are to be given to you. This is to be clear, this is the State Department of Agriculture or the United States? Hawaii State Department of Agriculture, the public documents. Hawaii, the Hawaii State Department of Agriculture, the documents reside with them. Who does the federal inspection? CDC. The Centers for Disease Control and Diagnosis. Website, you know what? Uh, let us. Uh, I don't know the answer, and I'm not sure we do. We have the answer. Question is, if we don't, uh, where we can, to access we can follow the up uh, with you and, and find federal out. safety inspection reports? If you if you leave us a contact number, we will follow up with where, how we can contact the CDC for the federal inspection, and we'll follow up. With you. <coughs> Uh, that's not a question that we're, you know. The next question is about security. There are several questions that you've asked about security. And here are, here are some of them. What are the security risks, and how do you address the ideas of a possible terrorist attack? How do you address the possibility of a worker error? Or how do you address the breakdown of physical equipment? That's, that is in the lab. That's the set of questions about security that people have asked. Or Jack, that you can look at that point back up so that you can see visually the of location. the area. So this thing, when you're talking about location. that mm -hmm. particular item or others for the vicinity, so we have a visual representation. Um, right. Is there was a slide Mark, of the Can you uh, come back up here, Mark, and, and load up the uh, one of those, and we'll see if we can get, you know, get it up quickly enough to, to be helpful, okay? Um, so, uh, who wants to handle, the, first of all, the questions about, uh, question about security, like, what are the security risks and how do you address them for possible terrorist attack or worker errors that might occur um, at the lab? Well, there, there, there are several levels of security, um, obviously, or maybe not obviously, but people who do work in BSL-3 facilities need, need to have clearance at, at various levels, including FBI clearance with fingerprinting uh, and security checks on, on all individuals who handle um, <coughs> things in, in the BSL-3. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I really am not sure that in any employment situation we can be 100% guaranteed that the people we hire are not having some criminal element um, in, in their future intent. Uh, so that there's no absolute assurance, um, and, but, but we just have to 
do our due diligence in finding out what their previous employment was and whether they do have a record in the past. Sir, can I ask a question? Can I, can I, can I just add Sorry, can you write down the question? Right. Well, I'm well, can I just address the second part of the question? Thank you. Um, another thing, I think if you saw the uh, slides, it's not that slide, but um, the uh, lab workers are working in pairs, you know, the buddy system. Um, that's a uh, uh, requirement. And uh, what we didn't show you is that there are cameras uh, that are recording absolutely every single minute inside that lab uh, tied to the security system. And uh, they're not just one spot, they're throughout the lab uh, complex that it's a very rigorous uh, surveillance system uh, inside the lab. And you know, that, that obviously that, that footage is kept for quite a while uh, so that if there was any accident or something that uh, needed to be uh, explored, that could be done with that video footage. Oh, and, and the background checks, I mean, this is, this is a tough uh, type of uh, employment to get into because it's extensive in terms of the uh, background checks, particularly the FBI background checks. Questions being the, uh, um, the last part of that question that uh, nobody did address was the, uh, the terrorist attack. Thank you. Oh, Just to set that up, right. Jeff. Yeah, um, the, the uh, building itself has a uh, you know, very robust security, uh, perimeter uh, security, and um, being near the National Guard base, I think, is uh, as a, certainly another element of security. Being near the FBI building has even yet another element of security. These are very, very hard buildings to get into if you don't belong there. There's just so many steps that one would ever have to go through. If I can uh, expound on that from the building and site design aspect of it, <coughs> excuse me, the perimeter of the site is going to be designed with a uh, uh, traffic barrier wall to prevent uh, large vehicles with explosive devices from running. I think we're looking at something about uh, 50,000 pound truck, well, excuse me, 35,000 pound truck running at about 50 miles an hour. Um, it has a secure entrance to the site. You have to pass through um, a gate arm and security booth. You have to have the right clearance to get in. Um, if you try to ram the gate, there are tire shredders going in and out, so in either direction. Um, if you happen to be within the boundary of the site, um, upon approaching the front entrance of the building, you have electronic security that you have to get through. You have to have an appointment to see somebody. You have to have prior clearance. Once you get through, you have to go through a metal detector. Um, there is a man trap there, so somebody can't run through and, and go uh, get to the deep inner of the building. And as was indicated on the uh, slide earlier, uh, every entrance, every door, there's some security measure increasing as you get further and further into the uh, building. Um, so these green layers of security are intended to stop any threats because we don't know what they are. Stop any threats at the earliest stage possible. But if you continue into those areas, it's not unlike an onion. You have to keep going through these layers, increasing in severity and hardness. The building itself, in fact, is going to be designed to withstand um, Category 4 hurricane, um, but also um, backpack bombs. So if somebody is not driving a car and wants to throw something over to the building, there's a 50 foot standoff. But we're building or designing the building to withstand small blocks. Um, the next, uh, the next set of questions is about. Relationship to the security there, please. Uh, what if it's quick? Yes. Quick, quickly. If we have all that security here at Kalai Law, why isn't the same security there at Kakaako? Why isn't there security like that at the Kakaako? Yeah. So just, just to be quick, um, much of the same security measures have been introduced at Kakaako. Um, there's special uh, reinforcement of the walls. There's multiple layers of personnel and biometric uh, passage, passwords, not passwords, but coding that's required for access. And there's a similar um, 
restrictions for employees, uh, and recruitment, that uh, there's some thorough background checks of the individuals and oversight via camera monitoring and the buddy system when they're in. So all of these measures, uh, to a large extent, are present now. You know, granted, some of the additional measures in, in regards to potential, you know, uh, someone wearing a, a bomb vest or something, uh, we don't have that measure uh, in terms of physical distance because our, our lab is built in as an active part of the medical school and part of our training and educational environment. There's a limit to what you can do under that environment. So uh, I'd say that probably 95% of what you've heard about that's in the design here is already in place at Kakaako. The other just wasn't consistent with an educational environment. Is Kakaako a level three or level two? It's a level three. It's a level and three. we have some level two as well, but it's predominantly level three that we're talking about. But it does not have the perimeter 50 foot cleared with the. Okay, we've answered the question. We want to, we've got a lot of questions here. Fine, I'm sorry. Just, I just don't want to get the people to, to, uh, to, to not get their questions answered. This is about some of the diseases. These are questions about what diseases are going to be handled. The first one is about will. Can avian flu, that was discussed in the previous one, in Rick's uh, presentation, avian flu, will this become a mutant form of ASN1? And second, the second part of the question, and one of the other gentlemen can answer this too, I suppose, what pathogens, or that's infectious diseases, I guess, what pathogens will the lab handle? And then I'll save the last question for uh, in just a second. So who wants to answer the questions about the avian flu and about what pathogens are going to be handled by the lab. Well, so currently, uh, the only pathogens being worked <coughs> on are dengue virus and West Nile virus. There's no current work on any type of influenza. Um, there may be in the future, uh, but, but none is immediately scheduled. Realizing that we are in a, in a state in which whatever organism we want to work on has to get a permit from the Department of Agriculture. And sometimes these permits take a very long time. Uh, and, and so, although we may want to work on some things immediately, we don't have permits. Mm -hmm. More questions so coming right in. Right now, the only two organisms are dengue, Virus, West Nile virus, we also have permits to work on a bacterium called Turcodaria. Um, and then there's a permit for tuberculosis, for bacteria, on the bacteria side. Dr. Nerekar might want to add. There's one other question about the kind of about what diseases, and it's about it's about animals. That's the first time we've had that question. What about animals? How long will they, are they, how are they being utilized? What animals are being utilized? And when will that involvement end? So for animals, the lab is designed to handle small animals, either mice, rats, uh, very rarely rabbits, and that is the smaller size. Uh, these are the kind of animals you'll be handling in the, in the, in the laboratory. Well, uh, I'm sorry. What animals and how long are you? And how long? Uh, currently, Dr. Yanagi has mentioned, uh, we have experiments going on for West Nile virus. West Nile virus experiments start from approximately say, 7 days to 21 days. So within 21 days, the experiment is completely finished. And after that experiment is finished, the animals are properly disposed of. Next set of questions was, there were three questions about employment. Are there really going to be employment opportunities uh, at this new lab? How many permanent local jobs? And can leeward residents get a priority? So, so uh, who wants to begin? <laughs> The first part was, are there really employment opportunities? How many permanent local jobs? And can Leeward residents get a permit? Okay. Yes, there are really uh, employment opportunities. Um, the rough estimate at this point is uh, approximately 20 positions for the lab. 
Um, and then, can we would, well, we certainly hope so. Um, that would be terrific, but not only for the community, but for, um, if you have an operation that's very, it's very important to, and it's very handy to have people who live close to it, um, not only for their new thing, but because um, they can be available perhaps more quickly if necessary. I want to just add on to that. Uh, we have in our audience uh, our research staff, uh, Beverly Urillo, uh, who is a local person. Uh, she was working for the Hawaii Biotech for a long time, and Hawaii Biotech folded up. She uh, went bankrupt, uh, and she's now working with us. So this is just a kind of classic example that we do provide employment to local people. Now, Beverly is not only person, there's another person in the lab too, who are the Hawaii Biotech. So when Hawaii Biotech folded, the almost there are 15 or 16 people. Uh, we were able to hire two of them in here. So I think we expect that we will be able to hire local people too. And, and just one more thing to add. Um, even though it's early and we haven't got a final estimate, um, a building of this size and complexity will probably demand of roughly 250 plus construction jobs. The next, uh, the next question is about, is I think one that wasn't, uh, uh, hasn't been, can, I get a, yet. can this lab go from a level three lab to a level four lab? Which is what, which is there are two of them right now, according to your presentation, there are two in the network, 13 BSL3 lab. Will this lab be allowed to go up to a level four lab? No. It's not designed to be a level four lab. We have no plans for a level four lab. Well, um, I can tell you that the lab cannot, cannot be upgraded to a BSL4 lab. The specifications and requirements for BSL-4 labs are completely different. Okay. This is the BSL-3 lab. Uh, if somebody has an imagination of that this can be made in the BSL-4 lab, it's just a dream. This is a sort of an, an, uh, a question that dovetails on that last question. Will the lab be turned over to the federal government or the military? And if so, will you be able to do level four work there and not let people know about it? Um, and, the, and the question goes on to say, um, will the military or the federal government, will they be able to keep everything top secret and not, not let the public know? That's the question I was going to ask. Precisely the question I was writing sure, down. Sure, sure, you can start. Okay. Um, the short answer that was already said about the level four labs is no. Um, from the design aspect of it, um, design and engineering aspect, it is, uh, as Dr. Nerva has said, it's tremendously more complicated, more complex. The basic difference that you can take away between a level four and a level three is you know, when we see in the movies and we're in the spacesuits with the well, and they're completely uh, the from the environment. That's a level four. For you to have that, you need all the engineering practices, all the engineering devices up in the ceiling to provide you that there. You have greater measures of security, which a level three is not even close to. So can it be retrofitted? Not without basically cutting the whole thing and leaving the facility, which is not feasible from a development standpoint. Um, the other part of the question was about Oh, yeah, the, the federal, federal or the military take it over and do top secret work there and not let anybody know about it. No, this is not a classified research facility. And, uh, but a requirement of the grant is that in a national <coughs> health emergency, uh, like SARS was, that the labs have to be made available as needed to um, health officials, uh, whether they be from the state or from the Centers for Disease Control or the National Institutes of Health. And obviously here with a very large uh, DOD presence and Tripler Army Medical Center and other uh, health facilities, hospitals in the uh, uh, DOD complex, some of those doctors could also be involved in responding to a health emergency if necessary. The next question is about evacuation. What's the evacuation plan? Um, in case of 
a problem inside the building? I'm assuming, um, I'm going to assume part of this question. If there's some problem inside the building, or if there's some natural disaster that comes, how do you, uh, what about, what do you do about what's left in there? If the people are evacuated, what about the, the whatever you're working on inside the lab? In other words, is it unmanned? Is it the, the place just open for problems? I, I'm kind of... The question isn't about in the facility. It's when there's a leak. What is the evacuation plan? Oh, well, they didn't talk about the leak. I'm sorry. I misunderstood. Yeah, My fault. Yeah, about yeah. um, what happens if there is a leak at this facility to the surrounding area? That's really what you do. What happens if there's a leak? A mistake of some sort, however. Everybody doing and to take the question. Um, so, I, well, um, I want to first go back and tell you that we have been operating such kind of a lab for the past 13 years in a, in a community from the Lehigh, in a, from Lehigh Hospital near MOP. So, it was operated in that, no incident. So, there are some engineering controls and engineering measures which are there to prevent any kind of a leak going outside. Now, if you want to start talking about what happens if all the hell breaks down and everything starts not going around, the question becomes you have to look at the risks of, of acquiring. Some of these viruses, for example, West Nile virus, cannot just pass on to you as an infected by rubbing on your hand. It has to have a mosquito vector. So the mosquito actually has to bite a bird, get the virus from the mosquito, or, or the, the mosquito gets the uh, virus from the bird, then the mosquito bites you, and then you get the virus. So there has to be a transmission, there has to be a vector, vector transmission. So it's not that easy to get this type of virus in the environment too. If, if you get a virus and keep it on this table and come back in 15 minutes, it is dead. It's what gone. So, so airborne, airborne viruses are like influenza viruses. So there are much more stricter precautions for that too. And they had to be, the, those kind of instruments had to be had in a, in a body system as well as if there's a leak, if any kind of a leak in there, it will be trapped up in the uh, DSC cabinet, the biosafety cabinet. What's the radius of contamination? Well, well uh, if, if we know that if there is a, if there is a leak kind of inside the, inside the lab. But out in the air, around but, your facility. Well, I think that if you're assuming that the, the virus is already leaking out in there, and if you have a leak of the virus, it depends upon how much virus is going on. When we, when we try to handle a virus uh, in, the, in the laboratory, it's kind of in a, such kind of a little, little cube, which is a cap of this particular bottle, okay? So amount of virus which is being handled at one time is so little that the spread is not that much either. So, so it, it is within, within the realm of, of the lab per se. But don't expect that, that this amount of virus is going to go out, fly out, uh, a mile or a mile and a half outside of the community. That's not what happened. Did you guarantee that? I can guarantee that. We want it in writing. Is it going to be on the website that it's not going to affect yeah, the surrounding people that live around in that area? Does it for schools? This is the. So, 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 go ahead and do it as an ad as well. So, community just as Dr. Mary Bush indicated, um, the, the actual volumes that are going to be handled in such a BSL-3 lab is very, very small. And just because you have a virus that can excuse be transmitted... Excuse me, excuse me, can we, can you listen to the answer? ...that can be transmitted through aerosol? Does it mean that once you open the vial, all of a sudden it's going to jump out of the vial and infect you? But more than that, you need to keep in perspective that every year in Hawaii, we have more than 200 deaths from influenza. Right? So influenza is not something that's restricted in a lab situation. It's out there. People get infected with influenza. You may not die of influenza, but influenza is very, very transmissible. Uh, and in a lab like this, even if you can think that there would be a leak, because the amount is so small and most of it would be trapped in the HEPA filter, what gets out into the actual environment, if any, Speaking now, Dr. Richard wouldn't compare to somebody sneezing in your face. So I, I, I think we have to put these things in some context. But 
again, because of these engineering um, safeguards and also because people are wearing protective equipment from, from, to prevent them from getting infected. Let me try and back up and get I, I don't really the questions know that how the community members have. Wow. The there's a there's a, com a companion question that I wanted to just add on to here, and that is, what are you planning to do about the daycare center that is close by? Have you met with the daycare? Parents. Yes, um, Have you met with the parents? Okay, okay, we've got the question. We've got the question. I did meet with the regional director and the staff director.
paid attention to the calendar. They are doing two years of planning. This is their first formal outreach in the community. They've met with the landowner, they've met with the um, uh, surrounding neighbors, they have met with the Kapolei Neighborhood Board Planning Committee. They are going to make a presentation to both the Kapolei and other neighborhood boards. I mean, but they can expand on what their plan is, but before the project is scheduled for as an agenda item, all of those um, questions will be asked to them. And, and so it's important that each of the projects do that prior to them coming and being scheduled for the agenda. Wait a minute. Wait, no, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to stop you because there's a question here that we haven't had as one of the topics, and I think it's important. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, ma'am. I'm sorry. You can talk to her about that when it went in a couple of minutes. This is not a public meeting that way. This is an information meeting. Let me continue. The public wants it to be a public meeting. That's right. What about this question? Cradle to grave for disposal of the wastes that are in the community. Right. Right. That would come out of this water treatment plant. Right. 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 The, the practice um, at Kakaako is, uh, as it would be at the facility, is the, uh, the waste are autoplayed, and if you're familiar with that, it's heat, uh, pressure, heat for 30 to 60 minutes, uh, so that it basically kill, it kills, it does kill everything that would be in the waste. After that, it would go in a, um, a double bag system to uh, a tower. Okay, we all know about the safeguards to keep the diseases inside the facility that we've been talking about. What about security to keep outsiders from breaking and entering and, and taking some of these biological agents and then taking somewhere and using them for terrorism purposes? There was somebody breaks in. I'm sorry? Will the community be required to run drills? Good question. Good 
Oh, is it gay thrills? I, I don't know. That, the question is, the, I read the question exactly the way I got it. Will the community be required to run drills? Will there be any drills involved? Okay. Not I see head shake indicating is no. The, is the lab, do you, do, isn't the lab a terrorist target? Yeah. Question about evacuation drill. Most of these agents are really representing a risk only to those who are actually using the agents when they're doing testing in the laboratory. Because the quantity is so small and their ability to be transmitted from person to person is so limited. So the concept of having some sort of a cloud or dispersal is incredibly foreign to all of us because the biology is not there. Um, one is more likely to be exposed to and succumb to some sort of a, an airborne virus by riding public transportation. Now, I don't want that to be taken as something against the rail or against the bus, but I'm just stating a fact. The reality is the risk is incredibly small, and it's greatest if it is existing at all to those who are handling the specimens. So a lot of the precautions that you've seen and heard about are for the safety of the worker the person who is working with the specimen. Because there isn't going to be some massive release. There's just such a tiny quantity of agents that are found in nature. Yeah, but doesn't the EIS require a worst case scenario? Uh, I think the question was that we had actually talked about an EIS requirement earlier. No, I'm, I'm saying, and, and I'm saying with re regards to the leak, regards to the leak, they keep on saying there's not going to be a leak. But doesn't the EIS require that you guys plan for a worst case scenario? Not, not a best case, a worst case. Can you, uh, can you that? Is that I mean, if you're going to keep asking questions and not give them Well, you guys are sidestepping our questions. Right. Yeah. Well, right. You're, you keep talking about an EIS and we keep explaining that their EIS is not part of this, it's not required. These are our process. concerns. This is our community. All right? I understand that. I understand Thank you. There's another question I want to get to before we have to stop. So let's and I think it's just... I think Dr. Jarrett, Dr. Hitchens just talked about the, the, the worst case Worst case is there's not going to be a leak. What do we do as best engineers? Complete evaluation. Uh, can, we get, can we get one more answer for this question about you know, people who live in the question are worried about the leak of material that is being done in this lab. That's the, that's the general consensus of some of this. Can somebody address that, please?
just because of the particulates that always exist in um, air, ambient air. Were you here when they built that lab? Were you here on the island when they built that lab, Dr. Austin? Because that was my question, something ground. And when they built Dr. Austin, there was nothing there. But only Kivala, there was, there was only John Dominus over there. But prior to John Dominus, that's why they used to have the tuna package. So that place was considered a dump. So you kind of say, I was against that lab in Dr. Austin, big time. And yeah, I was. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I want to get, you know what, I get one wrong. more question in this. It doesn't have to be the last question. But some of these folks will be here, and you can talk to them one-on-one -on -one for a few minutes until we have to leave the facility. The last question, I think, is one we haven't talked about yet, and that is, who's transporting this stuff to and from the lab, and from wherever it comes, and however it gets to the lab? How does that happen, and who's responsible for that? So all the, all the transportation of any biological material is done in, in, in tertiary compartments. So there is a, there is a tube that is tube in three different layers of protection. It comes into a into styrofoam box. These boxes are only handled by uh, government approved uh, workers, specifically for Federal Express or DHL or World Courier. All of these people have to be approved by the government, and then they can transfer from one place to other place. But again, this transfer from one place to other place doesn't happen in a in a in a vacuum. The person who is going to be sending sending the material first contact the person who is going to be receiving the material to tell that well I'm going to be sending this to you. So we get a Federal Express tracking number, and we track this in live time so that we know that this sample is going to be coming at our door in a matter of 48 hours. The entire process has been tracked, and the, and the transport has been done by somebody who is approved by the government. We are past 8.30, and I, I think we're going to have to stop taking the questions as a, as a group, but some of these folks will be, will be here, and you can, you're, you're more than welcome to speak to each one of them. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, by the way, this is the first of our series of community uh, efforts, and if you want to, uh, uh, if you want to look for more information, again, the website is on the handout. Thank you very much. No, James, and, and by the way, FedEx doesn't do bio lab training. I've got I've got the same clearance, the same training as those guys that are handling hazardous materials with FedEx. And I tell you what, they're not getting this type of training. Hey, James, what do you think of this thing? <laughs> you know, I thought we could be able to have a little interaction. Boy, here, they're controlling it, yeah. No, tightly controlled. Uh, he answered one question that I wrote. One question. And I wrote about 10. Yeah, that is censorship. That is horseshit. This is our community. We're not going to stand for it. They don't want to empower the community members to control and, uh, anything. Senator Espero here, my buddy, needs to be on that panel too. Him and Gabbard both. So we yeah. can answer. They can answer questions all the time. They would be glad to answer questions. <laughs> so what do you think, you guys? Any comments? What, one second. <laughs> okay. I should go. Ahead. Yeah, no, this is good. I'm glad it came out. I was getting good signal. Real news instead of fake news. Real stuff, and it's going to record so people can watch it. I may edit some good parts now. shot of all the uh, name uh, tags so that uh, we can properly identify 
people and my Let me uh, walk through here. Oh. There's a lot of... Uh, this is interesting. Uh, it was on very short notice and uh, the uh, community members that came were very upset. Oh, I want to get some reaction. Can I get reaction? What are we talking about? <laughs> I wanted to get it. Since 70, since, uh, since 70, oh, I mean, 20, years. So what's your general reaction to, not necessarily the project, but this kind of... Uh, well, this is, from what I'm gathering and understanding, <laughs> the first process of many to come. Yeah. And obviously you can see from those people who live in the area, one, they one have it. some very important issues that they want answered, and whether right. they got those answers or not today is, is very debatable. Yeah. Now, I assume that the individuals behind me are going to continue this outreach. If you heard what Pesha Mama said yeah. before they even go, or when they go to HCDA, which a meeting is not even scheduled on when we're going to go to HCDA, that could be 12 to 24 to 36 months away. HCDA will ask them, what was your community outreach? Who did you talk to? What feedback did you get, etc. So I think people just have to understand that we're a long way from a shovel now. Yeah. And I don't think it's a done deal. I, I, I talked to a lot of people, they said they got the feeling like it was a done deal and that this was just to announce it rather than to gather because information. It them. still has to go before the HCDA. Yeah. Okay. And we don't even know who might even be sitting on the HCDA in two years or more. Uh, so for anyone to say it's a done deal, they were, well, I think it's... I, I don't, I would not have run this meeting the way it was run and started it. I think they could have said a little more in advance to prep the crowd. But I think that's, they got off the wrong there. Boy, sure And then when they said, well, we'll read the questions, I thought that's fine. But once they saw people wanted to say a few words, they should have relented. And... I'm sure that they will learn from this process and future <laughs> meetings or opportunities will hopefully be a little better. We'll see. Yes. But I think that there's going to be EIS, uh, environmental protection uh, hoops to be jumped through. It's not very reassuring considering that a lot of them are going to decide to do some project. Uh, not a lot. Well, don't, there are say, don't say a lot. I would like to actually, okay, give me a list of all those a lot that are sidestepping environments. I mean, I would like to see them myself. Okay. okay. Hey, thanks, Senator Sparrow. Thank you. Okay.
Miss Senator Olivia uh, Sparrow. James Macy here. You know, people, I would ask questions, and you shut them down. And you're just a counter trick. These were the these were the rules that helped the University of Hawaii folks. Bright Light Market. What is Bright Light Market? It's a company that Why are you guys running this meeting? Shall I answer or do you want to just keep doing it? They asked us to run this meeting for them. They asked us, they said, here's how we want to handle it. Okay. And that's what we did. How much did this cost us? The taxpayers. How much did they pay you guys? That's a really good question. <laughs> good Seriously, how much my taxpayers' money for you to run this meeting? I don't know. Find out. I'd like to know. Okay, give me. Where can I talk to you? Give me my email. Okay. Okay. Did Roadrunner? Yeah. So, uh, I thought when you introduced you, you were like uh, the UH guy. I, I never said I was with the UH. So you're shutting down the community. Questions. Being rude to them. And you're just some contract. When they introduced you, they said you were from UH. No. I did I'm sorry, you're wrong. About that, you're wrong. Okay, well then I am mistaken. But, but, I mean, if... <laughs> So you're like a public relations okay, firm? Will, or will, yeah. yeah, public they relations. Will, they will answer questions. They will. I, I, my understanding is that the client yeah. I appreciate you being rude to these people. You know what I mean? They, these people have serious concerns here. Serious concerns. You were very rude. I don't like that. I don't appreciate it. Right? Okay. I don't like you being a contractor taking my money. My taxpayer's money. Well, these guys are, need to be responsible. They need to be, they, they need to be held responsible. They need to answer questions. The community wants to answer questions. It's a bright light. It's a firm, public relations firm, <laughs> that was uh, hired uh, to run this and to not take feedback from the community. This is a road show. Um, Wally, but Zimmerman. It, Wally Zimmerman. What was the name? Bright Light, right? Bright Light Marketing. Bright Light Marketing PR firm. And guess who paid for that? We paid for that. Taxpayers oh, paid for that. It. Yeah. Really this guy is a UH guy? I can swear. I'm sorry. Maybe I was mistaken. I hope they lose, they'll lose the contract. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the guy, did you know that it was a, it was a PR firm that was running the... Uh, Zimmerman, he's like a PR guy. Yeah, I know. They do that at all of them. They did that at the, the um, one with the Oscars, too. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, it's all PR they just firms. hire yeah. PR they guys. Hire them, yeah. PR, these aren't the real guys. These are PR guys, and it's a road show to sell all the community <laughs> and stuff by controlling participation. Yeah. That really sucks, bro. And the thing is, I'm you know, like, they put all this nonsense, this, this propaganda, and you, you, you call them on it, and oh, you write it down. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Your damn yeah. You know? uh, no, this and is they'll get gonna, back. They'll get back to us. Happen. This is awful. These mad scientists are not going to put this in. Well, I'm glad I came here. <laughs> and there we are, folks. It's at the end of... Uh, okay, 148 minutes. That's a that's a pretty good job, folks. I might go have a beer or something. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Well, I'll see Kaika. What do you think? See? Oh. oh, I thought everybody knows James. So I might uh, sign off. Thanks for joining us. I might edit down some of this. Um, and I'm going to save this so it should record. We were at the... Uh, wasn't a public hearing.